Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I was uh, sitting in that back room, listening to everybody connecting and laughing and just feeling so grateful when we get to be here together. I always feel that, but especially, yeah, especially now. Last week for those who were here, what an honor to be here together on such an intense day and <clears throat> feeling our way into the way that things are right now, day by day. And I'm hoping that this place and this space for us just continues to be a support and a place for inspiration and connection. And I, I know I often say this, but for real, like what is covered in the text tonight is so unbelievably poignant for where we are right now. It's just so on point. Um, so I was really excited to, yeah, to connect with the text again this week. And for those who maybe haven't been coming, um, no problem, or who are experiencing temporary amnesia as a result of cognitive and stress overload, uh, we are making our way through this beautiful text of the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, an eighth century text by Shanti Deva, with commentary by Pema Chodron. And I'm not trying to compare them, but let's be real, Pema's commentary is on fire. The original text is beautiful. Um, and the whole purpose of this text is how do we live with an open heart in a world that is on fire? And how do we train this heart of compassion to be a warrior's heart of compassion? So a heart that is both open, supple, sensitive, but really strong. And uh, spoiler alert, uh, you have to work here with this instrument that we have in being able to kind of further and further polish the inner lens, see ourselves more clearly, stabilize and calm the mind. And then also find the ability to connect with deep care without feeling overwhelmed and without getting, you know, lost in despair. Kind of timely, right? <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Um, so yeah, I, I really am taking refuge in this text, in these teachings and feeling really grateful for them. And think that tonight, <clears throat> Yeah, we're, we're covering this aspect of the discipline of non-harming, uh, how we can, you know, learn more and more to recognize and become aware of the difficult, disturbing emotions and habits and patterns and behaviors, even as they're rising up and like when we're feeling them and even how we respond to them. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of really simple, clear wisdom on how to have this uh, discipline of non-harming. And also the, the secondary part of this chapter that we might get to tonight is on cultivating virtue. And I like to think of these two together as pulling out the weeds and then planting the seeds. So in getting ourselves with that kind of discipline, right, of being able to attend to the mind and notice when we're succumbing to rage and despair and overwhelm and anxiety. And then also like highlighting the ways that we can show up with generosity and kindness and presence. So the both together. How's that sound? You wanna watch the news instead? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so we're gonna start with a practice and we did this a bit last week and in our dedicated practice group, we've been working with this. Um, I think it's, it's really, it's such an interesting and important shift of generating a sense that our awareness is actually kind of infused and imbued with, with love. So that our, our awareness is loving awareness and doing that as a way to host whatever is coming and going through that. So not a need to um, shift or change what arises, but this, instead of, you know, kind of having that color our entire experience, we can feel as though we're, there is something bigger than what is passing through. 
And, and I don't know about you all, but I really noticed today I had a little space um, to be and there was nothing explicitly wrong, um, but everything just kind of felt wrong. And it's less of an emotion, meaning less of like a triggered experience because of something and more just this either, you know, collective nervous system weight um, or just the residual uh, momentum of trying to turn away from what's hard, which many of us have to do to just get done what's done. And my hope or aspiration for us in bringing this loving awareness and loving presence is that we can allow that worry or those emotions that we've been kind of pushed away, allow them to have the space that they need, not so that we then energize them with our thoughts and pour kerosene on the fire, but so that we can let that kind of energy of the difficult emotions be nourished by the loving awareness. And I don't, I don't want to put an agenda here like, okay, we're going to have loving awareness, emotions come and then they're gone. But it's almost this, think of it as titrating and using our meditation as a little laboratory in which we get to explore bringing loving awareness to what's actually here. And for some of us, this, this might not feel right tonight. Maybe what we feel is like too big and we don't want to go in there. No problem. Just bring loving awareness to the surface level of your experience. Beautiful, useful, super worthwhile. Um, but this is an invitation and a place I think is meaningful to hold one another to really invite what's here and kind of feel into that through the body. But I wanted to let folks know that so you can kind of check in with yourself and, and see. And also, you know, as is completely understandable, you might check in with loving awareness and be like, I don't even know how I feel. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, which is a very skillful response often when things are difficult and also a very natural response when we're so fucking busy all the time, right? We just might not know what we're feeling. So don't, don't judge yourself on any way of this. If your feelings are big, if your feelings are suppressed, if you're just drifting away, whatever we can do to like invite and keep inviting that sense of loving awareness, it's gonna be <clears throat> of great benefit. And in this book, uh, the first three chapters are dedicated to the cultivation of bodhicitta. And it's, it's done so, so beautifully, um, bodhicitta being our awakened heart for the sake of all beings. And each chapter goes about, it's like highlighting the undeniable value of bodhicitta. It's good for this, it's, you know, it does your dishes and your laundry, pays your taxes, right? Bodhicitta as just this, this, this treasure that we have within us, this treasure of being able to feel how deeply our heart cares. Just that, right? The awakened heart. And then, yeah, we are doing it for all beings of all time until space remains, <laughs> which is like a long time and a big deal. But we start simple relative bodhicitta, you know, is simply like loving awareness, right? That's what it is. And meeting whatever comes with loving awareness. And we don't choose like, oh, I can bring loving awareness to these thoughts that are positive. No, we bring loving awareness to everything. And actually there's nothing that can't be kind of transformed alchemically through loving awareness. So that's, um, that's my upsell of loving awareness for you all. So with that, let's go ahead and find a posture that supports us. Again, the time change, the world political scene change, it's normal to feel a little tired. If you can and you want, you can sit on the front or the edge of your chair, can kind of help be a little more upright or at least bring your back off, um, giving yourself a little more wakefulness. And it can be helpful to come in through the doorway of our breath and allowing our breath to help us focus our attention and awareness 
allowing our breath to help us find stillness. So we're gonna extend our inhale as we inhale, counting to four slowly. And then holding briefly at the top for two. Exhaling slowly for four. Holding at the bottom for two. Starting again, and when we inhale, letting the belly fully extend. Allowing that pause at the top and that equal exhale, gently pulling the belly backwards towards the spine and holding the pause. Continuing with this extended breath and especially noticing the pause, the quiet of the pause, the stillness of the pause, the anticipation of the pause at the very top of the inhale and the very bottom. So let's continue with this inhale of four, holding for two, exhale four, holding for two. And for these last three breaths, with the exhale, letting the breath travel out through the mouth and kind of feeling that extra level of release and sigh as we let the breath come through the open mouth gently. So inhaling through the nostrils, holding and then exhaling. Twice more, inhaling. And holding. And releasing. One more time. And hold and release all the way out. And for a moment, notice if there's any shift or change in the mind and body from that slowed, intentional breathing. And continuing to deepen into our settling of the practice by settling the body in its natural state of stillness. Breathing in and sensing the whole body breathing in. Breathing out and sensing the whole body breathing out. And feeling and finding this choice of stillness in the body.
and our attention and awareness can find its home in the body. We experience a sense of spaciousness through the body, unbounded sacred space. We then settle the speech in its natural state of silence. And turning down the inner volume, the narration of what's next and to come. And simply following the subtle sensations of breath. Again, the silence is a choice. Of course, there are sounds outside, thoughts, memories, and images. But we deliberately place our attention on this capacity for inner silence. Feel or imagine the sense of inner refuge, settling into the stillness of the body, settling into the silence of the inner speech. A refuge not to escape, just to be held and safe within our own experience. We then settle the mind into its natural state. Like that beautiful moon rising. Luminous, clear, bright. And also like the sky that holds it. Rich, dark, vast.
And take a moment and notice whatever is the quality of the mind, busy or tired, agitated, longing, lonely, distracted, delighted. Is there something which holds these experiences that is greater than these experiences? And directly turning towards that which is hosting all of our thoughts and memories, all of these passing waves of emotion, sensation, feeling, which holds all of our experiences and phenomena is our awareness. Without trying to force it, is there something already loving about this awareness? Gently feel the sense of leaning back in the mind, leaning back into the awareness which is love or loving. And seeing if we can have a sense of welcoming spaciousness for whatever arises. Maybe a painful sensation arises in the shoulder. We become aware of the sensation. And then we lean back into loving awareness, hosting that experience of physical pain from that which is larger than the physical pain. Maybe we are aware of a contraction, some heaviness in the heart. Can we lean back, making space for whatever that experience is, but hosting it in loving awareness? This loving awareness, we will know it if we experience it not only as warmth, openness, but also that luminous quality, bright, vivid, clear. And for losing the vividness and clarity, maybe just giving ourselves a chance to recalibrate, focusing in on the inhales, and then as we exhale, extend and expand awareness outward. 
Inhale, focusing in, getting the brightness and the clarity of focused attention. Exhale, releasing to the warmth and the vastness. Until you can just stay, maintain in that exhale. Resting, open, vivid, loving awareness. It's okay if we get caught up or distracted. We can always return. And we may notice that the loving awareness can start to feel more compelling, more exciting than any of the other phenomena that arise. The to-do list, the worries, the replaying of what happened earlier. None of it is banished or unwelcome. But continuing to find the space around it, the loving awareness that can host it. And feel and imagine that anything is welcome here. There may be moments where instead of feeling that loving awareness is the host and something arises in it, that we experience ourselves as loving awareness. Feel this as our body, as our mind, as the space around us.
just a couple more moments here. Wherever you found yourself returning to loving awareness or sustaining the loving awareness, breath by breath. Feel and imagine that we could be like a lamp of light with this loving awareness. And just our focusing towards it allows it to illuminate and radiate this loving awareness all around us. Feeling that heart of bodhicitta, this dedication of our practice to being that lamp, that loving light all around us. Thank you for your practice. So here at the do I see that someone's waiting in that waiting room? Or no. Does it say admit? No. I don't know. My eyesight's not good enough. Oh, good. So here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, we get this precious opportunity not only to practice together, but to reflect on practice together. And at the simplest level, just from an educational standpoint, we learn from reflection, right? Listening is helpful, but actually reflecting on our practice is really what helps us um, integrate and embody. And in order to do so, it's like such a magical uh, ingredients that come together every week here it's never the same twice, or it hasn't been so far. And so we get to constellate each week a new pop-up community for one night. Some of us come often and know each other in this space. Others, it could be our first time, or we don't come as often. And so for us to be in um, sacred community together, there's this um, magic that we create of really applying what we're going to be talking about tonight, this discipline of non-harming through body, speech, and mind. So when we're hearing people speak, we're really doing so with the kind of ears of compassion. When we ourselves are sharing, we're also sharing from a place of compassion. And as much as possible, doing so with consideration for others in the room and for ourselves, and it's impossible to create a completely safe space. Um, 
And yet our aspiration here is to create a space that feels welcoming and caring. And we need all of us together to do that. How's that sound? You up for it? I mean, if we can't do it here, at least we gotta try. Uh, okay, great. So I would love to hear from anyone um, about their practice. Also about how practice is meeting you these days, the challenges or the opportunities of it, given this somewhat unique phase of integration that we're in. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I think there's a mic. Cage has it, which means you can also kick us off if you like. I was worried about that when I grabbed it. I was like, does she do this? Before? Occupational hazard. <laughs> um, this one was a lot easier than the last time you did this. I had a much easier time. Um, it was very vivid. I, I, I think I heard you say vivid. And um, so it, my mind went from being really busy at the beginning where I didn't think I was going to sort of be able to calm down to actually it, it sort of, I think, turned into like some vividness once I started mm. to relax or some, something happened. Yeah, there, I guess. Yeah, which felt um, and I was able to hope maintain that for like, maybe the last half beautiful so that that felt really good and I think with it sitting in my body. It, it felt just really airy and sort of spacious I didn't really notice how but that was interesting yeah to me to explore more I guess yeah. I could just sort of feel it maybe where I was sitting but everything else felt really. I don't know, spacious. Maybe I yeah. couldn't find it. Yeah, <laughs> almost. Yeah. Um, and how practice is meeting me right now. I have found that, and I know you, you've said this before. A lot of us come to practice when things aren't going so great, and that was my journey too. So, when things aren't going great, I have a tendency to really lean into my practice, and it's almost makes my practice more committed. Yeah, I'm dedicated more to it because I rely on it for my mental health. Yeah. And so that so that's a benefit. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. Like that. And I don't want to say silver lining ever right now. But no. Yeah. No. But that's um, also true. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's helpful. Yeah. In a way. Uh, so that's what I've noticed. Thank you so much. See Jason's hand there, little yellow hand. Hi there. Hey, so good to see you, Eve. Um, I wish I was there uh, because, uh, frankly, I've been having a really hard time. Um, and it's it's kind of like waves uh, for me of of just grief. And grief isn't just because Kamala and Walt's well, lost, but because loss has resonance. With all lo with all my loss, and so the grief is just sur yeah. surging up through this um, this experience. Um, and the, what what was really great for me tonight was um, through through your guiding, I was able to see the storm going on inside. I was really aware of how much noise there was and how much I was resisting it, kind of. Um, and I finally let go. And what I wanted to share was just that the feeling of um, moving from having, from being in the storm. Well, I think you use the word the moon rising. I was able to kind of just go above it or front. It's almost like front. I was in front. Mm -hmm. of, the awareness was, it was all there, but it was like I was present in front of it, and it was so much um, easier to just deal mm -hmm. with. It was engaging. I was kind of just, oh, okay, well. I know there's a lot of stuff going on, but right now the present felt like that reassuring place. Hmm. So I was like, oh, phew. You know, it's it's hard to access when you're really deeply moved and engaged, but the way that you moved us through that really helped. So I just wanted to share that. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. and. And you're right, you know, often 
loss brings up loss brings up loss. And as I mentioned last week, for many of us who were at the Dia de los Muertos, that was its own portal of loss and then leading into the week. And um, yeah, and, and you know what, what Cage also mentioned, which is when times are tough, the Dharma is pretty helpful or it can be, might not be like right in the acuity of it all, but um, yeah, there's a real sweetness to being able to find that refuge. So, yeah, thank you. Any other thoughts in the room? I know we have one hand online too, but yes, please. I don't know, I don't know if I've had a lot of feelings. I more just feel numb. And I don't know if it's turning away because I don't, um, yeah, I don't, I don't see that the usefulness in engaging in it because I don't feel like there's anything I can do. Mm. So when I was sitting, I was trying to think like to ease up on the polarization of like the us and the them and mm. just realize that everybody's just trying to get through the day. Like it might look really different, <laughs> but at the end of the day, everybody's just trying to get through the day. So. I um, I was like, is there any way you can hold love here? <laughs> and I was like, well, what if you were thinking about like a toddler who's like just like being terrible, right? Like just throwing the worst tantrum ever. It's like, like sometimes when toddlers are like, they just lose their mind, right? The only thing that kind of helps them is when you hug them really tight, like that pressure of love where they can't. Hmm reorganizes their sensory system or so <laughs> holding a like a, I don't want to be elitist or anything that like my love is going to save them or anything yeah. like that but just that like just trying to find any kind of place where it's not I don't know hate or or um yeah polarization I guess yeah so, yeah so <laughs> Yeah, my reflection was a toddler. That's beautiful. Yeah. No, I love that image. And there is like in, in the classic teachings, this idea of when you really struggle with compassion with someone to imagine them as a baby. So that's good intuition. And I think we will be actually tonight talking about um, these different ways that we can respond to, to difficulty. And some of them are more cognitive and some of them are more emotional. Um, and it, and it's very natural to experience numbness, which is one part, or experience kind of like a appraisal strategy, which is like, I can't do anything about it, so I'm not gonna think about it. And there's, that can be very effective in the short term. Sometimes it does like end up creating extra pressure because with our emotions, this physiologically, the suppression of them actually makes them stronger internally. So not meaning like you try to push down sadness and you feel more sad, you push down sadness and your your autonomic nervous system is, is more aroused. So it's not as though you'll even experience it as an emotion, you just it's overwhelming um, to the system itself, it kind of like extra depletes you. And this might be familiar to anyone who's in a helping profession when you get home at the end of a shift or a day, and you've just been not expressing all day, you've been holding back expression all day, and you're like, oh, so tired, right? And it wasn't that you, like, kind of tired that as though you had been crying or yelling, right? Because that is actually this big um, energetic effort to suppress. And numbness has so many different reasons, though. It's such an interesting, like, I, if I had limitless government funding, Studying numbness would definitely be something I'd be interested in because I think there's probably like a whole typology of numbness and different ways that it comes up. Um, and I, you know, I have had this idea of myself of like, oh, I just like feel all my emotions and, you know, they, I don't even have a choice. And then I'm like, oh, actually, you're numb right now. <laughs> and like, you know, I find myself experiencing numbness at different times and not knowing why. And it's a very interesting area. And I think with this 
practice, and KG mentioned this too, but the interesting piece of being in loving awareness and in the body, because so much of our emotional experience is held in the body. So to move through the emotions, we want to be able to actually experience the impact on the body. Um, so that's a, yeah, and almost invariably, if we're thinking about it, we're not in the body, right? We get up and out and thinking's great. I don't want to knock thinking, but there are ways that thinking, especially when it comes to our emotions, is truly like pouring kerosene on a fire, not helping us, but actually making it much more inf literally inflamed. Okay, I think I see Elizabeth online there. Hi there. Yes. Hi. So um, I noticed that I'm reflecting on my practice while I'm in my practice. Yeah. <laughs> not 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 always the worst thing. Okay. It just de it depends on the quality of it. Like we do, there is kind of for for most of us, especially um, if we're just practicing without. Um, guidance or teaching like we we do need to kind of provide this inner scaffolding to our experience so okay. sometimes as long as we're not making it the focus of our practice we might notice like oh wow my body feels so at ease and then return to the practice or oh my god i can't stop these thoughts i need to come back like that's actually developing the meta awareness oh, needed okay. for our practice as long as it doesn't override um, right. our experience like that inner narrator can yeah. be a supportive coach okay <laughs> yeah yes i was reflecting on the the three precious pills and how it's hard to hold on to any one of them at any given time mm, yeah. and trying to have all three of them at the same time is it's going to take a lot more practice yeah <laughs> yeah and and for those who don't know that settling the body speech and mind are these three precious pills um, that's the term that Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche describes these doors into um, our, our experience of being, yeah, fully at home with ourselves, kind of the soul retrieval, the sense of really being here with ourselves. And it is interesting because I think it might need more practice. It might also just need more relaxing because sometimes oh. the, eff yeah, sometimes the efforting with our practice gets in the way of the practice practicing us um you okay. know and you've, had a, you've had enough time with it right that it might be like the relaxing into feeling that it's there just as a possibility okay like the leaning back and maybe trying to be more intentional about what i'm leaning back into yeah and and even just relax like you know it's it's so tough because with practice sometimes we can you know we can try a little too much or we can try not enough. I mean, there's both, right? So it's yeah, like- I recognize that, yes. Yeah, so just to kind of play with that, because there's, okay. I mentioned this before, but you know, Alan Wallace describes, you know, our practice po posture is like deep existential relaxation. So mm -hmm. that's not necessarily relaxed, like watching Netflix and chill, right? right? Yeah. But it's a like it's an existential relaxation. Like we're not trying to be or do, and that's when we can maybe get that glimpse of like, you know, mini cessation, like mini moment of I'm not Eve practicing. I'm just practicing uh, when mm -hmm. we're so in the practice. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's an ex existential relaxation. I haven't fallen asleep. I'm not distracted. Right. But I'm just so in my practice. I feel like that goes and then along you grasp with after it for like weeks. Sorry. <laughs> I, I feel like that feeling goes along with the loving awareness. Yes, like, exactly. Yeah. It's like yeah. to ourselves with our, you know, I was, I had this image uh, practicing loving awareness earlier this week of me having loving awareness for what was going on for me being like um, how the sun and the night sky are holding me in loving awareness they are not intervening or changing but if i notice right like we're held by this perfect planet um so it's like that level it doesn't have to yeah. be super demonstrative like i love you like <laughs> just this you know so 
Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. My system actually Thank relaxed you. when you were describing that. So Good. awesome. Good. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Yes, Belinda. Um, I don't know. Last week you were really talking about practice and the sense of how we've been practicing for this moment when the world's on fire. And I've just been noticing like binging in a different way, but like binging in practice and binging in community. Like I went to yoga three days in a row and then I was with you on Wednesday and Thursday. And then Friday I went to the East Bay meditations like, and then I was dancing with friends and here I'm back. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just feeling so appreciative though. Like my body just felt really safe mm. and that hasn't been the case for a lot of my life, but like we can find refuge in each other in this practice mm. and there is so much love and joy around us mm. even in these fucking wild times yeah. you know and i mean i know i'm sorry i'm always talking about my job and my <laughs> students but they teach me that every day and, yeah. and just like what you were talking about like they need to be squeezed and right now i'm like teaching them just like hold yourself love like really squeeze really hard and then a child today was just like losing it and he's like this is like too much for my body it's too much for my mind i can't take it you know and then afterwards he was just like oh what am i gonna do you know like this is gonna happen again what mm. am i gonna do and i'm like you're just gonna be kind to yourself and you're gonna love yourself mm. um but i'm just feeling really appreciative for mm. all of you thank mm. you so much thank you yeah that touches me it is a uh, yeah precious time to lean in if we can so with that oh well i, I mine is very brief and that is take um, your time i meditate by myself 95 percent of the time and i forgot that there's a synergy when we meditate together and i felt it full on yeah. tonight it's like oh this that's coming together and meditating is worth something. I feel it. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. The end of one experiment, but yes, it really, you know, synergistically is so interesting. And like on the nerdy research side, we've had now decades of research that say that meditation and mindfulness helps us. But what we're actually studying is the practices of mindfulness, the group container, a little bit of poetry, sometimes some yoga, right? Like those are the interventions. And I was talking with some colleagues last week, like I would put money that the group itself is like 85% of the intervention. You know, the coming together in a structured way to practice. And so you see when you move these online, like different results and different experiences. Um, but yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's on that same note, Melissa and I were at Grace Cathedral hmm. for the sound bath. Oh, nice. And, you know, there was 1,200 people there, everyone with the same intention. And, you know, so no matter how hard things get, there's a community like this. I don't feel bad for some reason, hmm. you know, because I have faith in y'all. I have faith in, I have faith in people and, you know, the one thing that we can do is just be better versions of ourselves every day, hmm. you know, and yeah, times will get hard, but then, you know, you teach impermanence. I mean, we go over that here all the time. Yeah. And so this too shall pass, yep. you know? Um, so I was just like, okay, we, you know, it's going to get rough. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Um, Cause we're all speculating still, you know, yeah. until things do happen. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's it's not for forever yeah you know that's what i'm looking forward to yeah and you know my practice today was you know reflecting on that on that you know things come and go you know bad things good things and then being where i'm at and you know um, being also you know in healthcare, i find myself holding a lot of space um and today i just you know i felt it was really interesting because i was meditating for myself then something I got to that point where you say we're just it's not me it's just 
and it was just like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna sit here and hold space. Yeah. You know, uh, and so, yeah, I thank you for guiding us and thank everyone that keeps coming and keeps coming back. And I, you know, this is, this is what keeps me faithful that, you know, we can get through this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful to hear. Yeah. And that, you know, the holding space, right? That term, we use it so often, but like what an amazing gift if we can actually hold that space of loving awareness for others. Um, and there, and it is again, such an interesting balance of how do we do that without draining ourselves? Like either what's the recharge or what's the kind of posture we hold so that we can be open, but also, um, like strong and nourished. And I agree, like practicing together can give the nourishment. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad. And um, yeah, anyone else really appreciating people's reflections? Also okay if you feel lost in despair and no amount of anyone is making you feel any better. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I feel like I have been feeling a lot of despair and frustration and all kinds of grief related things since last week, but um, today I wasn't feeling that when the practice started. I was grateful for that, and but I think it helped with the like getting into that space of loving awareness and almost kind of like inviting those different emotions that I felt throughout the week, mm. those different parts of myself that were attached to those different emotions and like inviting them to like be in my presence mm. as I like held that loving awareness. Mm. And it was kind of like, it wasn't like seeking them out necessarily, just like holding the space yeah. um, and seeing if they showed up. And it, I don't know, I felt like it, really did some healing mm. um so i don't know it it was easier because i started in a place of feeling pretty good but anyway it might have been harder if i was starting with one of those emotions but yeah anyway it really worked for me tonight i'm so glad thank you and thank you for sharing yeah i think i love that image you know like the emotions here like holding them and it is, it's so interesting, right? Like they really, they kind of are here and where they actually, they're invisible, in case you didn't notice, um, unless you watch Inside Out or Inside Out 2. Um, but they are, they're like in that control station and our relationship to them matters so much, you know? And it is so essential to not get too, um, caught up in that. I mean, I, I was, I was sharing with a, another, uh, a colleague today, I've spent, you know, 15 plus years of my life teaching about emotions and very much focusing on our individual experience of them. Really important, our individual responsibility for them, how they relate to our past histories. Um, and they also relate to, you know, our present context in terms of like, are we tired? Are we hungry? But it's really only been in these last couple of weeks that the true understanding of our collective nervous system has settled in to me. And I realize it's not only me experiencing an emotion, it's me experiencing also the emotional field. Um, and there is pretty good evidence out there that we all are kind of, you know, it's not that we're the same, it's not that we're feeling the same things, but there is also a collective experience of emotion that's happening. And that's such a, it's so aligned, right, with bodhicitta uh, and with the Dharma to really recognize our emotions aren't just us and, and like, they're not me and mine. They are a response and a reflection of this world. And so we can hold them with loving awareness, like we hold all the world with loving awareness. So that's been yeah, so tender. 
doesn't make it much easier, but maybe more authentic. So, so with that, um, I am, I'm passing over for those who are like hardcore with me in this book, like reading every note that I'm going to skip over three pages, but I, um, I wanted to highlight one passage because it's, it's one of my favorites. Um, and this is in the last chapter because before we move on page 123. And I've said this before as an analogy, but I love the description, the actual words here of Shantideva, this eighth century teacher. And the whole chapter is on taming the mind, how hard it is to tame the mind. And he says, this mind of mine, a wild and rampant elephant, I tether to that sturdy post, reflection on the teaching, and I shall narrowly stand guard that it might never slip its bonds and flee. So this idea um, that the sturdy post to which we tether our minds is reflection on the teachings so that we can help tame this kind of wild elephant of the mind by focusing time and time again on exactly what Ulysses was saying, everything is changing. Like what helps our mindfulness isn't just the attention training, it's like the clear seeing, remembering over and over and over, you know, whatever our wild elephant of the mind is rampaging about at the moment, right? It will change, it will shift. So I just love that. This mind of mine, a wild and rampant elephant, I'll tether it to that sturdy post, reflection on the teaching. And I shall narrowly stand guard and the narrowly stand guard, that is the mindfulness, right? That's attending to and recognizing our mind when it's becoming fixated and ruminating that it might never slip its bonds and flee. Um, there is one more little stanza here that I, I have to put in because it's pretty funny. Um, it says, <laughs> in fearful situations, times of celebration, one may desist when self-survey becomes impossible. For it's taught that in times of generosity, the rules of discipline may be suspended. Essentially, like, don't be so uptight with your practice. <laughs> if there's a party going on or if things are really scary, like you can actually just feel your feelings, like it's okay. Um, so she, Pema says, this is practical advice for the overzealous, a fledging bodhisattva who goes to a party and tries to practice tight mindfulness instead of relaxing and having fun. Such rigid self-observance is too harsh and in terms of rousing the good heart of bodhicitta, counterproductive. <laughs> So don't take yourself too seriously on the path, on the path, which I think is always important. And then, yeah, this just, I really, um, yeah, I really appreciate this chapter. So this is um, the second half of Taming the Mind. And the first stanza is, when the urge arises in the mind to feelings of desire or wrathful hate, do not act. Be silent, do not speak, and like a log of wood, be sure to stay. So when the urge arises in the mind to feelings of desire or wrathful hate, do not act, be silent, do not speak. The exclamation points with these. And like a log of wood, be sure to stay. And I'm, I'm, I've mentioned this before, but I actually <laughs> brought up this teaching to Minja Rinpoche when I had a chance to uh, connect with him. Beautiful teacher, uh, Tibetan teacher, who's, you know, uh, incarnation of more than like, you know, seven or eight generations. And he, I said, what is this like, be like a log? I was like, this is not very helpful advice um, while we are emotional, right? Like, what does that mean? And he said, oh no, it's a, it's a bad translation. He said, it's be like a tree, root into the earth. And I was like, okay, that makes a lot more sense. Um, but I like, there's a couple stanzas in a row, but I'll highlight this first one, when the urge arises in the mind. So the next three stanzas go through the full time course of when we become aware of our emotions. So there is, if you notice, and I'm curious if anyone can like recognize this, like even before we get into our full-fledged emotion or response to our emotion, 
there's this kind of like urge in the mind. Often that then leads us to like open our phone, <laughs> right? But that urge, right? And to catch it right at the urge. Do not act. Be silent. Do not speak. Essentially, it's saying be still, root firmly in the ground. When that kind of, you know, for me, what I've been noticing is just that quality of like uncertainty and agitation, right? And you're like, I want to, what do I want to do? Oh, like, oh, like something. Be still, be silent, do not speak. And then the next stanza, when the, when the mind is wild with mockery and filled with pride and haughty arrogance. Anybody? <laughs> this is like that othering you were talking about, right? When the mind is wild with mockery and filled with pride and haughty arrogance. And when you want to show the hidden faults of others to bring up old dissensions or to act deceitfully. And when you want to fish for praise or criticize and spoil another's name or use harsh language, sparring for a fight, it's then like a log you shall remain. So the, when the mind is wild with mockery, I mean, this is just like literally, I mean, I'm not really on social media, but I know that 85% of it is like the mind wild with mockery, right? Like <laughs> making fun of, you know, blaming, like pointing out faults, filled with pride and haughty arrogance when you want to show the hidden faults of others. It's like kind of like we're living in that, right? Like a lot of our polarization um, and sense of other is really caught up in that. To bring up old dissensions, so to kind of like dig back in the past, you know, remember that time when you da da da, uh, or act deceitfully. Also, when you, it's like this full laundry list. When you want to fish for praise, <laughs> I think that's a funny turn of phrase, but you know, um, I know it well. Like most of us know our sense of love and safety in the world when someone else is reflecting it to us. And when we feel tired, stressed, vulnerable, uncertain, we like want that praise or I want to even use praise. We want that like reflection even more. We want someone to tell us we're good. Or if we want to criticize and spoil some, some another's name or use harsh language, getting ready for a fight, it's then like a log you should remain. So yeah, the commentary here is so beautiful. Um, Pema says, here Shantideva describes being on the verge of getting carried away. And there are four places that we can interrupt this powerful urge at the pre-verbal level when a thought is still small or when they've already ensnared us or just before we act out. Emotional turmoil begins with an initial perception, a sight, a sound, a thought. It gives rise to a feeling of comfort or discomfort. And this is the subtlest level of shempa. So this word that we learned earlier, it's kind of the tug, the pull of the emotion. The subtlest stage of getting hooked. Energetically, there's a perceptible pull. It's like wanting to scratch an itch. We don't have to be advanced meditators to, to catch this. So again, what she's highlighting here is that, you know, there's an experience of our emotion as it arises that we can catch right there. And it's in some ways like what we impose on top of that feeling that gets us into so much trouble. So sometimes here in this course and in um, the teachings I do on emotion more specifically, there's this goal or this hope that we could meet the emotion as emotion. We could meet the emotion as its feeling and its sensation and without adding extra story to it. And in a lot of the, you know, traditional practices of working with emotion from Buddhism, it really is dropping all of the narrative, the kind of sense of what was done to me or not done to me, and really just noticing the feelings of it in the body, the kind of contraction in the mind, and letting it dissipate, which is very much being like wood, right? Like rooting down, being with our breath. Um, yeah, it's, 
And then it's like, I, it's really interesting here because, um, you know, in studying the contemporary science of emotion, this is like, this is very beautifully described. It's very, there's like such a mirror, which makes sense because these practices are born out of close observation, right? Over hundreds and you know, thousands of years, what happens in the mind when we get caught up in emotion? You know, what's likely to occur? What can we do to intervene? Um, and she just, she says, the practice of remaining like a log is based on refraining, not repressing. This is such a good nuance and we'll unpack it a little bit. When you realize you're thinking, you just acknowledge that and turn your attention to your breath flowing in and out or to your body, to the immediacy of your experience. It allows you to be present and alert and for the thoughts to calm down. Um, so when we look at the difference between this repre repression and refraining, we actually do get into um, a bit of the, the science around kind of emotion regulation or emotion regulation strategies. And there are certain things that we can do to help work with big, strong emotions. Some of those we can do before, kind of called like antecedent strategies, and some that we can do after. Uh, very little we can do right in the middle of it because often we're so in the grip. But just from James Gross, who's a pretty well-known uh, researcher from Stanford, last couple decades looking at the difference, what I mentioned earlier, the difference in the body when we apply different strategies of emotion. So I mentioned that suppression actually creates more activation in the body. That's his foundational research. And we see that some of these antecedent strategies, um, these are like nice to haves. So <laughs> some of these strategies include uh, situation selection and situation modification. So one might be um, for some of us right now, we might not reach out to people who have different views from us who are in our families, right? That's situation selection. Like I'm gonna not create the conditions for difficult emotions where I have the choice. And then situation modification, I'm gonna reach out by text and emoji only, right? So like how do we, right, like communicate in ways that are less likely to lead to these inflamed emotions you know so part of it is using our wisdom with it and that's getting even you know pema and uh, shanti deva are saying get to the emotion at the urge these strategies are like don't even get into the territory where that emotion might arise but as we all know or and <laughs> we don't get to choose always our situations, right? Like the people we run into, the news, right? So we don't, those aren't always possible. The other, this is actually a little bit of an in the moment strategy, which is attentional deployment, um, sometimes called distraction. So like you're getting triggered and you're like, I'm gonna count the number of lights in this room, right? You're like getting yourself somewhere else in the moment can, that's a be like log strategy, right? Going somewhere else. You go somewhere neutral, like I'm gonna feel my elbows, like somewhere in the body that feels um, safe and easy. Attentional. Yeah, I know it's kind of a weird one. The, you know, the, the one that we, I'd say, both in social psychology and in Buddhist practice are most often working with is this cognitive reappraisal. Uh, and that is changing the way you're thinking about the situation. Seeing the toddler, right? Or, you know, being able to have in some ways your experience infused with loving awareness and compassion. And that might mean that, you know, we're, it's like we're almost as we're experiencing the emotion, we're engaging with the whole worldview of our perspective, the whole sense of interdependence and impermanence kind of rises up to meet us. So these cognitive reappraisals, I mean, often, especially for those of us who are kind of getting ourselves close to the practice now, and maybe in general, it's like your difficult emotion arises and like the Dharma arises right with it. And it's like, it won't always be this way. 
or I care about this suffering. Right? Just those like small reappraisals that help us in the moment. They're like mantra, right? They're like thought and heart protections. But these kind of words or phrases that they can like, it's like they hold us, right? They help us. And then there is, you know, it's not even really considered a strategy or emotion regulation strategy, but the suppression and the way that James Gross describes it is this expressive suppression, meaning you're actually feeling it, but you're trying to not show it. And that's even different than full suppression where you've pushed it down so hard, you don't even really feel it. There's nothing to suppress externally because you've suppressed it internally, usually so long and so habitually. And the consequences of that are really high. Um, it really in the short term can be useful and all of us have to do it sometimes, but it creates this sense, um, he calls it emotional incongruence, but I've heard it before as self alienation, a sense of just being disconnected from our own authentic feelings, good and bad. Because when you're suppressing so intensely all the time, it's actually hard to have access to what feels good. So you're kind of blunting the whole system, which is why, you know, because I <laughs> many times in my career of trying to spread the good word of emotion awareness, um, I have met with people who are like, why? <laughs> like, why would we do that? Things are going fine, you know? And I was like, yeah. Except that that expressive suppression, you know, is cutting you off from a sense of meaning and purpose and joy, not to mention like running havoc on your nervous system through that suppression all the time. So it's not just a, a nice thing for us who care about Buddhism and awareness to do like it, it really the only effective strategy is this kind of cognitive reappraisal. And what's interesting about it. Um, at least my, my theory in observing and, and working with these ideas is that reappraisal at some point becomes antecedent, meaning our view of compassion in the world starts to rise up even before our emotion gets triggered. Just that possibility, right? Even if we're kind of constantly in this process of working our mind and our heart and our body with compassion, there's a way in which less things might kind of trigger us on a good day. But when we're tired or stressed or overwhelmed, yeah, we're back to baseline. So don't be discouraged. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's normal um, under stress to kind of return. But I like that possibility and, and I've seen that, you know, from teachers and monastics who have dedicated their life to these practices. It's like, there's like nothing to grip onto, like that, you know, whatever trigger to emotion would arise, but there's so much just compassion there, so much care, it doesn't, um, doesn't get quite as big or quite as inflamed. So it's a good thing to have as a, as a um, motivation um, and inspiration, even if it can feel far away. Before I say a couple more things, other thoughts or questions on this? Yes, please, Shane. Okay, so um, on the repression versus refrain, you can be avoidant, which might look like you're refraining, but you're actually repressing. Yes. But there's a little different quality to it. Yeah. Can you say something about that? How is it different? Well, um, it doesn't seem healthy, I think. Right. Repression so, is definitely not healthy. But I mean, just avoidance. I also think. not healthy. Yes. Um, so I, I think it'd be easy to trick myself that I'm refraining when I'm actually just avoiding is what I'm getting at. Ah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, suppress, deny, avoid, right? I, I kind of always put those together and they are a little different. You know, the suppress might feel more effortful. Like I, I see you, but I deny you. Um, and then the avoid is like, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pretend I don't see you. And the deny is like, this isn't happening, right? 
and they they all have a similar quality to me and for sure they all have the same impact um and they are just you know probably related to our early childhood attachment um and what made us feel safe in an unsafe world and so they're very hard to unlearn and the way to kind of approach it is usually retrospectively so not in the moment but looking and being like wow i was really not letting myself see this and with that tenderness you know letting ourselves see it feel it know it yeah thank you yeah great question yes I'm just wondering, I know there's not really an answer to this, but don't you think that anger and frustration in situations like this could also really be fuel for change? And so maybe, we, so I'm just trying to kind of balance, you know, when it's useful yeah. and, when, and when maybe that friction is a good thing. Yeah, no, great question. And the idea is not to get rid of emotion, but to respond really skillfully. And, you know, so any emotion can be enacted in a way that's very skillful and any emotion can be enacted in a way that's really unskillful and this is this chapter is almost entirely about unskillful um but absolutely you know anger is uh, sometimes called or described as mirror like wisdom you know it really can help us clearly see um and also gives us a lot of energy it's when we get caught up in the story of it, dragged around by it, um, woken up in the middle of the night by it, you know? And so it's, it, it really is up to us to become clear on, you know, what is in some ways, you know, the intention behind continuing to ruminate in this anger. Is it fuel for my fire or am I burning myself out? Yeah, great question. Yeah. Any others? I'll just say what I didn't get to virtue, but that's okay. You guys know virtue. Um, <laughs> we'll do it again. Um, one thing I, I love that Pema says here too is the initial tug of for or against is the first place we can remain steady as a log. Like just that simple line, this initial tug of for or against just experience the tug and relax into the restlessness of the energy without fanning the ember with thoughts. If we stay present with the rawness of our direct experience, emotional energy can move through us without getting stuck. If, da, 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 da. Yeah. She says, the last place that we can hold on to our seats is just before we take the fatal step of speaking or acting out. Um, and this idea of like, do not act, be silent, do not speak. And this tug of for and against, it really kind of gets and drives into, you know, this source of our initial, what is often called ignorance, uh, which is separateness. I'm against that and I'm for this. I'm different than that. I'm not the same. And how much, again, like trying to see so clearly the bigger, bigger picture of it. And when you look at the, the social science on polarization, um, you know, some of the suggestions of how to work with it include this perspective taking of our common humanity, like getting bigger. And I know it's so obvious, but it really, you know, is so essential in order to not get caught up and dragged away by these difficult emotions. It's impossible to continue perpetuating our rumination about another person's badness if we are like seeing that bigger picture. It's a little different when it comes to the sitting with fear and uncertainty. The sitting with fear and uncertainty is different than f sitting with the anger and blame. You know, the anger and blame can be very much supported by this feeling of common humanity. And the feeling of sitting with uncertainty, it's just, it's so hard because it makes us need to trust and let go of control. I mean, 
right? The good news is, wait, the bad news is, you know, you jumped out of a plane and there's no parachute. The good news is there's no ground, like yeah. Chogyam Trimpa, right? Like that kind of trust, not like it's going to be okay, so trust, but like, well, like there isn't a deal for a safe passage and the cost is too high. So stop trying to make deals, you know, just really allowing the uncertainty to be your ground, um, which is, again, only possible with loving awareness. So with that, let's give ourselves a little more chance to sit in loving awareness together. So just coming all the way home to the body and to the heart. Welcoming whatever is here. And finding the presence or glimmer of loving awareness. Seeing if we can experience just that some aspect of that sense of being a light of loving awareness. Something that is within us, something that is shareable. And then if it feels natural and comfortable, placing the hands together at the heart in a gesture of offering. And we dedicate this loving awareness into all of our energy gathered here together. In this great and beautiful and outrageous vow that we may be an island for all who need landfall, a lamp for all who need light, a bed for those who are weary and need rest. May we be medicine and doctor for those who are suffering, and for all beings of all time. May we dedicate ourselves to freedom, peace, and ease as long as space remains. Thank you all so much. Feels really special to be here.